Texans introduced H-Town Blue to the world and went toe-to-toe with the Buffalo Bills. We're going to get into all of that and more on this edition of The Bullpen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you are listening to this podcast. This is The Bullpen, a Houston, Texas podcast, and I am not James Roy. This is Third Coast Tom. This is Tom Chavarria. And today, joining me, uh, you know, pinch hitting because James is doing dad detail. He's welcomed his second son to the world. Uh, Healthy and happy is what I've heard, so we'd love to hear it. Houston Stressens, the one, the only, at Texans Commenter. Garrett, how are you doing this day evening whenever I'm, I'm big blessing man i appreciate you guys having me on you know it's an honor to step in uh for james and shout out james congratulations to him and his family on their on their second child that's that's awesome yes sir yes sir as, as parents you know that 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 new kid smell the whole thing it's it's definitely an experience i, I totally remember mine so uh Good luck, James. Uh, there's going to be a long, a lot, a lot of long nights. Not just about you know the Texans play, but also you know bottles and diapers and things of that nature. But let's get into this matchup with the Buffalo Bills. Definitely a highly contested matchup of two three and one teams. You know this was an opportunity for the Texans to show, okay, we're here to play with the big boys. What did you think going into this game? Uh, going into it, I was confident, you know, I didn't really, I did my show on Wednesday where I kind of like dive into like the stats and positional breakdowns. And I realized like we had a lot of key advantages and then obviously over the weekend, you know, I think it was Friday or Saturday when the uh, injury reports were dropping, there were some big injuries on both sides of the ball. Obviously ours was mixing, but the news for them with Khalil Shakir being out and Ed Oliver being out. And then obviously a couple days before with Vaughn Miller being suspended um, they also had a starting safety out. So um, the game, I started exactly how I thought it would. And then, you know, the Texans played this game like they did 90% of their games last year and like they've done 90% of their games this year. They've dominated the game in the box score and they've played with their food and they played uh, to a way to where I came up with my name, Houston Stressens. <laughs> And so it basically just sells itself every week. I say, hey, this is why I call us the Houston Stressens. Um, you know, again, we've still found a way to get the win. So we're definitely blessed now. Um, but, you know, there are some fair criticisms, which I'm sure we'll get into. But it's definitely, uh, I think CJ says this a lot, but it's definitely to correct your mistakes in a win versus a loss. So, you know, big picture, we're still four and one. There's a lot of things we can improve upon, but. It's kind of scary to think about that we haven't even come close to playing our best ball and we're still four and one. So uh, that's that's what I got for now, but I'll I'll see what you got and then kind of dive back in. Well, I definitely agree with you. I definitely feel like that's something that, you know, that's part of the key takeaways from these last few games where you really felt like the Texans had moments where they looked really good, had moments where they looked really bad, but still found a way to get it done. But let's dive into this Buffalo Bills game. You know, right off the bat, there was some injuries uh, early in the game and before the game that were kind of uh, interesting. You know, Titus Howard was a late scratch. I didn't expect that. I don't know if you saw that coming. And uh, enter Blake Fisher. What do you think of him early on? Yes, I mean, the Titus Howard, I think he was like showed up on the injury report late. So, I mean, I really didn't know what to think. Um, but uh, Blake Fisher did a great job. I mean, I haven't really obviously dove into the film or the grades quite yet, but uh, from the naked eye, from being at the game, um, I think maybe on that strip sack, it seemed like the pressure might have came from the right side, so maybe he got beat on that play. But, I mean, the O-line as a whole, pass protection, gave up one sack for zero yards. Uh, obviously, there was pressures like we've seen in the past, kind of masked by CJ's ability to flush the pocket. But, I mean, we can't really complain from a pass pro standpoint from the O-line, so... I think Blake Fisher did great. So early in the game, Texans get an early stop, and then Jimmy Ward gets injured, and and I really don't know what to make of of where Jimmy Ward's at. Obviously, he's a he's a leader in the clubhouse, right? A lot of guys look to him, but right now he's really having an issue with little nicks and and, and injuries and things of that nature. Um, 
But I thought the guys that stepped in for him did a really good job. What did you think of the Jimmy Ward injury, and what did you think about uh, the guys that filled in for him while he was out? Well, so if if you guys don't know, I was late to the game because I got a flat tire on the way to the game for the second year in a row, and the Texans are now 2-0 and on games that I have a flat tire en route to the game. So um, I didn't get to see the Jimmy Ward injury. I asked my buddy when I got there. He said it seemed like a head thing, so ho- I'm, I'm going off of that. I don't know if they were just testing him for a concussion and he got checked out fine. So if that's the case, it's, you know, that's just – you can't really – you know, fault him for that. They make you go into the tent. And then I'm pretty sure he played the rest of the game and he went down later in the game, but it seemed like just a cramp. So from an injury standpoint, fine. And then um, I really didn't focus on him, but the way the secondary played as a whole, I would have to say he played a great game. I mean, pretty much everybody did. Uh, it did seem like our game plan was um, we started to load the box after early success by the Bills running the ball. And then we put trust on our uh, secondary to play man-to-man coverage, and they did a good job. So uh, I like it. So early on, Texans get the ball deep in their own end. Uh, I I don't know exactly when we should pick up, you know, when you were in the building. But uh, something that that I think is is starting to become an issue, and and it was like an issue throughout the game, and hopefully it's it's only a theme here, is special teams. Uh, Last week, Steven Sims Jr., he had a very poor game, got some silly fouls, and he was – I think he was out for injury this time, but who knows? Maybe it was disciplinary at that at that rate. Um, enter Robert Woods, and then Robert Woods struggled today. What do, what do you make of the kick return game? Uh, as far as, like, the punt return, um, and I will say – so I was able to, like, keep up with the game, like the box score and, like, watching my phone, you know, getting to the stadium and walking in. But the first play that I sat down for was the 60-plus yard bomb to Nico Collins. Ooh. So that was incredible. Um, but as far as the play, like the punt return, I thought was pretty good. I mean, there were a couple times where uh, Robert Woods probably shouldn't have fair caught it and let it go into the end zone. But um, he also had one big return. And then, honestly, one of the most not talked about big plays of the game was his return on that last drive to get us – basically to midfield to set us up for that field goal. I feel like that's not being talked about enough. Like that was pretty dang clutch. So um, I do like the decision by D'Amico to take action, to hold Steven Sims responsible for, you know, that, that bad performance last week and, and, and not start him today. So, um, and I was talking about budding the seats. I mean, Robert Woods did good. We could definitely do better. I still don't know why we don't have Tank Dell back there. I mean, there's really not much more of an injury risk. And he is electric. I mean, he was one of the best punt returners in college. And knowing him and his personality, I'm sure he would love to return punts. Um, but the big concern for me on special teams, obviously, Kaimi is elite and a game changer. But punting on our on our end, our, our punt uh, unit, I mean, specifically Tommy Townsend, I mean, what is going on? You know, he was supposed to be one of the best punters in the league punting for the Chiefs. Maybe he just didn't get a lot of practice because they never punted, but uh, he has been a major disappointment. And that that was between their our punt unit and their punt unit, they probably gained at least 100 to 150 yards of field position. So that was a big difference in the game. Yeah, I really feel like that Robert Woods, I, I don't I know why they do it. He's sure handed, you know, a veteran. He's been doing it for a long time. You know, I do believe that they worry about Tank Dell getting injured on something like that, where they really want to have him as a weapon for the offense. But um I, I totally agree. I think it's something that's got to be looked at uh with with specifically Tank Dell. I think he would be perfectly fine doing that, especially with how hard it seems like it is to really integrate him into the offense right now. I mean, they run some plays for him, but I think right now it's pretty clear if you're looking at this team on the offensive side of the ball, Nico's option A, uh, Stefan Diggs is option B, and then everyone else is whatever the, the, the option C is. So the fact that he's in that position – I think we need every advantage we can get on the kick game because of what you spoke to where, you know, Tommy Townsend isn't really doing us any favors on the punt game. So to be able to flip the field when we get the ball for me, I think is a big deal. And I just, I just hope it's something that gets looked at. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that you can really go at Robert Woods and be like, Hey, you know, be better. 
but um, maybe try maybe try Tank. I think Tank would be great. And then um, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, this next week against New England is like I think in this game is like we like you mentioned Robert Woods being a sure-handed returner. Like we weren't going to play any games. Like obviously that Jacksonville game, like without that muff punt, like that's not even a close game. So we kind of you know let them in the game. I think D'Amico said like we're not doing that this week. This is too big of a game. <laughs> Um, so maybe he can reintroduce uh, Sims back next week against the Patriots, a game that you're expected to win. So, um, because I mean, after if you know if we don't want to do Tank because we'll get hurt, and then if we want to improve from Woods, like what's your other option? We created a seventh roster spot as a receiver for Sims to be the returner, and then now he's not being the returner. So now we're kind of in this weird position, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, it's just little nit, nit noid things that you hope they can get better at, right? Obviously, yeah. for me. And, and I know some people don't love it, but I, I really just care about the W. You know, yes, you could have very sexy wins, but if they're if if they're still able to get it done in the end, would I like it to be 34-10 and we're just kicked back, you know, you know, enjoying the fourth quarter that means nothing? Absolutely. Do I do I care that it's 23-20 if we get the win? Not not entirely. I wouldn't like it to be as, as stressful as it has been lately, but like you said, that's that's why Houston stressens is a thing. But uh, going back to the the Nico Collins bomb, um, just tell me kind of your your perspective, how you saw it. I mean, I, I I really thought he did a phenomenal job, just head down, you know, st- straight down, not 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 messing around, ran through the coverage, and CJ did a great job of finding him. Yeah, I think Bobby Slowick deserves his flowers on that. Uh, it was an up-and-down game for Bobby Slowick as a play caller, but uh, that first drive was very disappointing. You know, a check down to Dare and then two runs up the middle with him. But um, I believe that was a third drive when Nico caught that bomb. It was a play-action pass on first down, and they picked on the rookie safety Cole Bishop who stepped in uh, for Taylor Rapp. So this guy is making his first-ever start. And I believe from the naked eye in the stands, I need to look at the film, but I, th- I believe it was cover four. Um, and so the corner had a deep quarters and the safety had a deep quarters, but uh, Cole Bishop bit on the play action and Nico just ran right by him. Um, awesome ball, awesome route, awesome catch. Um, and that was a play, obviously, where Nico tweaked his hamstring. It must have been a lingering issue since he was on the injury report the week prior. Um, it's like maybe he was just legging it out just a little bit too much, but, um, yeah, I mean, what a sight to see. That was like the deep shot we all wanted to see, but that is a subtle reminder. Like I know it's, I get just as frustrated as everybody else watching these runs up the middle that just go for nothing. But that is something to keep in mind is without those, you can't really have these big, you know, deep shots. So, um, yeah, I, yeah, I thought it was great by Slovak and I guarantee you they, game plan hey if this safety's out we're going to pick on this rookie safety and it, it worked what do you think about the people that that question bobby slokes play calling saying that he's holding this offense back i see that a lot on social media and and after the first drive if you went to twitter if you went to instagram you were seeing the same comments mm-hmm. bobby slok is vanilla he's he's run 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 pass what do you what do you think about these comments uh, I would say up until like the second half of the Jacksonville game, I thought it was like wildly overblown. And then at, you know, in the second half of the Jacksonville game, it did, I did start to see some of these first down runs where it was like, okay, now we're doing it too much. Um, and then in this game, I, it's kind of the same thing, you know, first half, he was great. And second half, there was some, it was more so, I don't know if it was, the, there were some frustrating first down runs for sure in the second half, but it was also some of the decisions that really got to me, but I overall think it's wildly overblown um, from a production standpoint. I, I think CJ is the leading passer in the NFL right now. Um, and, you know, I'll talk with people and they're like, Oh, this guy needs more targets. That guy needs more targets. Like, what do you want to do? Put the ball 50 times a game. Like not every receiver can get 10 to 15 targets a game, you know? Um, and then I point out like the point I made earlier is, um, you know, that big deep shot to Nico isn't possible if you don't run the ball. You can't just, this isn't Madden, you know. So I get the frustrations. I think it's somewhere in between. Like a lot of fans are really upset and some are defending. It's, it's probably somewhere in the middle. I mean, he's not perfect. He's still young and learning. Um, and it's also, too, I mean, you got a young quarterback and it's, you know, they've had a lot of challenges and you know, defenses are evolving to them. So they're seeing new stuff and, and having to adapt on their own. But 
I think he's plenty fine. I think we're fine. Um, and a lot of the issues aren't what people think, you know, they think it's red zone and they think it's, um, too much of the first down runs. It's really just self-inflicted pen- penalties. And that's what happened again in the second half. We started stalling out. Obviously Nico is out, but a lot of it was because we started getting more of those penalties again. So that's really the biggest issue. Yeah. I, I, I can't stand uh, the the hate for Bobby Slowick when you have the number one wide receiver and the number one quarterback in the league. Like, obviously, they don't do that without him. So I I really feel like some people get lost sometimes in, oh, well, this team should score 30 points every game or, oh, every drive should end in a touchdown. And, And, you know. Why isn't the running game better, and why do we lean on the running game so much? Uh, speaking of the running game, what did you think about the the, the uh, start that Dari Obungawale got and how they managed Dari and Cam? I think their roles kind of flipped a little bit. What did you think about that? Again, this was something I liked, um, You know, kind of like how Steven Sims didn't start as a punt returner. I mean, I thought Dari had showed more promise up until this point as a running back as opposed to Cam Akers. I know he hasn't gotten a lot of uh, – carries but you know obviously the passing game but uh in the preseason he looked pretty good so um that was kind of cool to see it's like okay like in their eyes they're p- playing the best player um but then when you go back and look at the box score Dare had uh he he obviously was a great force in the passing game he was our second leading receiver in yards and he tied digs with receptions six for 57 but running the ball he was 15 for 30 yards average two yards a carry Whereas Cam Akers was nine for forty-two with four point seven. So again, it's like it's like it's such a weird thing with Cam Akers. We walk away from these games like thinking he had a terrible game, and you go back and look at the box score. He's our most efficient efficient runner. So it's just a weird thing to, to do. But I like the approach. Um, I do think that Bobby. Again, I need to kind of go dive in during the week, but like from the naked eye. Uh, I noticed last week we ran more gap scheme than we did zone for the first time all year. I think he's trying to adjust to what works. And it, it did look like we were running more gap scheme during the game and it was more effective. And then I do know for sure we ran a, a lot more uh, 21 personnel uh, with two tight ends. So uh, I'm sorry, 12 personnel with two tight ends. And, uh, you know, overall we finished with 94 yards. It started out great in the first half and it kind of fizzled out in the second half. So Speaking of some of that 12 personnel, what did you think of the play call to have two blocking tight ends had Stover and, and Schultz block on that touchdown run by Cam Akers. I thought it was a great design play, and I think no one's going to give Bobby his flowers for that. And yeah. uh, I'm, I'm kind of I was kind of surprised that we got a, a, a Dalton Schultz blocking, you know, tight end play that I, you couldn't look past. You know, most people were like, "Well, this guy can't block." You know, he's literally just out there to catch, and then schemed up a good play, got him to a linebacker, and I thought it was great. Yeah, I think it was a counter. I'm not sure. It looked like we had a pulling uh, guard as well. Um, and then you looked at Akers. He had so much space out there. He could have cut so many different ways. So, I mean, yeah, I was, like, excited. I thought, like, oh, we're about to start running the ball. Like, the run game's back. You know, it kind of misled me a little bit. But that specific play and play call and play design was great. Uh, we had a, And, like, all the first-half runs that were successful, I mean, we ran the ball pretty good in the first half. It seemed like more of that, like, like we had mentioned, the two tight end sets and uh, more of the gap scheme, like maybe counters and stuff like that, as opposed to zone. So um, maybe that maybe that's the the temporary solution until you know an elite back like mixing with elite vision comes back and and makes it easier for us in the zone running scheme. Definitely can't get mixing back soon enough. I, I definitely need to find out where he got that sweatshirt he had on the sideline. That thing looked amazing, but I needed him in pads and out of this sweatshirt. Uh, first half ends. Texans are up 17 to three. I got to imagine that building was amazing uh, for halftime. Second half, Texans come out with the ball. I feel like a score of any kind, and, and we're going to be in a great situation. What do you think first drive out of the halftime? Uh, I need to jog my, mem- my, my memory right now. I believe it was probably a three and out, I would assume. Let me see here. Uh, no, cool. they, they got down and kicked a field goal. Oh, got down and kicked a field goal. Okay. Yeah, no, it, it was good. Um, you know, obviously points are good. So, I mean, that's that's what you can ask for. I do. I did have qualms with the way we ended the first half. I feel like we kind of got lucky at the end of both halves, honestly. Like, the way we managed both of them were putrid, in my opinion. And then we ended up having it work in our favor somehow. But 
Uh, we were way too conservative. We always are before the first half. Um, we have all these timeouts. We run the ball first. Okay, fine. But we get a good chunk. And now it's like second and, you know, three or four. And they, is that rather, rather than line up and run another play, they decide to drain all the clock and go to the two minute warning and then come out and run another run play, I believe. Um, you kind of just killed your momentum. You know, you had a big chunk play and then you decide to stop it. And we ended up getting lucky by punting and then forcing them into a punt and then getting a field goal. Um, and the same thing happened in the game too. But um, yeah, it was nice to have that uh, come out of the first half and get some points. So, I mean, we're up 20 to three. So at that point we're all thinking, you know, this is about to really get, you know, get crazy for us. But Obviously, you know, we let them back in the game. So, yeah, next drive. Obviously, uh, I think that was that was the one that had the fourth and five, where all you need is a stop, and uh, they get Kamari Lasseter on Keon Coleman one on one on the outside. I thought, you know, myself personally, I thought there was a little bit of a push off by Keon to get the separation. But then for me, the big thing that Kamari, I guess they've got to coach up or. You know, he's got to be able to make the tackle, live to fight another day. He kind of made a yeah. dive and uh, he swung and missed. And then there goes Coleman down the sideline. What did you make of the play? Yeah, so I haven't quite looked at it closely enough to – I've heard that that people thought it might have been a push-off. I did see that uh, the right tackle looks like a false start on that play. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was just a simple five-yard hitch route. There was nothing crazy to it. I guess they just figured, hey, he's a bigger bodied guy. We can, you know, throw it to him on a, on a smaller corner compared to his size. Um, but I agree, like at the very least, like the tackling on that, you cannot miss that when you're in man coverage. Is ba- you know, it's there's no one behind you. It's basically a touchdown. I think it was Stingley got blocked by maybe Kincaid. They did a great job blocking downfield the tight end. Uh, and he tight rope the sideline, you know, potentially went out. But, yeah, I mean, what a – momentum changer in that game you know they go from you know not converting or you know taking a risk to not only converting but scoring a touchdown that that changed the whole momentum of the whole game so uh, hopefully Kamari gets better on that yeah because because from there I think you you saw uh uh, okay it's still two two score game but now you know a stop and they're they're right back in the game and sure enough next drive Texas moved the ball a little bit. Uh, a really great job by the linebacker, in my opinion, just to really confuse CJ. The, one of the few mistakes we've seen CJ make. Uh, dude backs up into coverage. CJ thinks he's got digs on, on an inside route and he just steps right in front and picks him off. Um, from there, I just thought I just thought the, the wheel started coming off. I, Jalen Petrie gets, gets uh, uh, assessed a 15-yard uh, rough in the passer or, or – you know, helmet to helmet, whatever. And I, I, I saw a lot of things on social media where they were going after Jalen Petrie, and I feel like he's just an easy target for a lot of people. And in that particular play, I, I, again, I don't know what you saw, but I don't. In, in the moment, he didn't really like lean with his head. I thought he caught him, but I also felt like you know he had Aziz Shair over the top, and I think that just kind of like compounded the issue. Um, I really felt bad for Jalen Petrie because I, I didn't think he played like a terrible game. But I think a lot of people remember that penalty because it really got uh, Buffalo moving. So I didn't get to see it on the, the TV replay. I just saw it from my vantage point in the stands. And like what I saw was like it was just the two defenders just ran into each other. Like it even looked like they even touched Josh Allen. But I guess he did hit him helmet to helmet. Was it a legit penalty? It was It was very glancing. But I mean, anytime, you know, Larry Tunsil gets a false start. Jalen Petrie gets a penalty. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's just the the, the low hanging. But it wasn't. Fruit. But like, I guess what I'm getting from your take was like it wasn't like he just like was like reckless and like made some dumb play. It's just one of those like random bang bang and yeah. I mean, I don't. You know, if anything, it's just bad luck. I mean, they did catch a lot of luck. I mean, they had that. They had that Josh Allen fumble where the ref said he fumbled the basketball out of bounds. Um, you know, Josh Allen has played better this year and had less turnovers, but he's still doing the same stuff. He's also been put in better situations where he's not doing it. But if you look at PFF, like his turnover uh, worthy play percentage is still like in the high 4%, um, pretty, pretty high up there. I think CJ Stroud's like two point something that's just to put it into perspective. But 
I mean, you saw it today. There was like five or six turnover worthy plays a day. I mean, at least two for Aziz Al Shayer. I think back to back plays that could have been picks. Uh, the Kamari Lasseter one, that fumble, um, and then I, I believe a couple others. So, um, but all those things. Uh, and then Petrie had the one where um, it, he came off came off the end free, basically had a sack, and kind of just unlucky that when he went for the grasp that he didn't get the ball, and then Allen was able to dump it off for an incompletion. So there's like so many little things throughout the game like that. that just kind of changed the, the outcome, you know? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, obviously you hope that they make all these plays. It's just, you know, the fact that they're, they're, they're this close. I feel like towards the end of the season, I think that's when you start to see them get home. And I really feel like where, where people get kind of stat crazy with turnovers and sacks and things like that. I really think that when you look at the, at what, Josh Allen's numbers were at the end of the game. You're like, how did you limit this guy to, well, I think it was nine for 30. Nine of 30. Like, yeah. be, to hell with sacks. I'll take that all day. <laughs> like you want like six sacks and give up 30 points and 300 plus yards of passing. You know, it's like, like we're good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's similar to the, like the sack, you know, obviously we'd like to see more sacks. Um, and, but like the pressures are there and maybe the QB hits are down a little bit, but, it's kind of similar to the receiving stats. Like, oh, we need this guy to get this many. Like, no, like we're still passing for plenty of yards. We're still, you know, moving the ball. Um, I, th- I feel like we just kind of get hyper focused on stats, and a lot of it too, I believe, is like our own induced hype. Uh, this off season leading up to, it, we're all like fantasizing about this roster. Like, okay, this guy's going to get this, this, and this. You know, it's like all that matters is the win at the end of the day. I totally agree. I, I, I and I know, like I've, I've seen it on on socials where people are like, "I don't want to hear a win is a win." You know, they need to be better. They need to do this. And I do that. I'm like, look, in the end, no one's gonna care that you won thirty to ten or twenty three to twenty at the end of the season. They're gonna go, "What is your record?" And the, and you know, then you're gonna go wherever you're gonna go in the playoffs or whatever. And those games will will be more dissected. But as far as like a game in you know, late September, early October that you won by a field goal. I don't, I don't think in the grand scheme of things, it really matters. But well, uh, those, same, those same people were assuming that the Bills would beat us by 30 because they beat the Jags by 30 and we barely beat the Jags. So then we used to like, no, we dominated the Bills. Like, so like none of that stuff matters. Like every game is different, you know. And like you've said, like a win is a win regardless. Like, yeah, you can still like say we need to improve stuff. We all agree. But like you shouldn't discredit yourself for the win. Like. I mean, you watch today, like, look at all the teams losing. You know, the Niners blow it against the Cardinals. Like, every game comes down to the wire for the most part. Um, obviously, we have higher expectations and think we shouldn't do that. But, yeah, it's just try to keep things in a bigger perspective, I think. I couldn't agree more. I think that's that's really how you make it through a season. And then once you get to the end of it, then you can take, you know, account of all of it and go, well, this is where they should have been better. This is what, you know, could be an issue how you reshape the roster, things like that. But, I mean, getting back you, to – You could argue these close games, though, are, like, helping us build resolve and learning how to win these tight games. So, like, it is a – although you would prefer to blow people out, like, now we are comfortable and know what to do in these situations. So that's kind of the silver lining. Oh, 100%. You know, a game in, in December where they, they need a score at the end of the game, they'll have been in those fires, been in those wars. So exactly. you'll have that to lean on where, okay, the confidence is there. So I, I know people really want the best version of the Texans, and I think they'll get it at some point this season. Yeah. Uh, but right now, to not get that and still get a win, I think, is so critical for this team because when you look at the standings, 4-1, and one, basically have a three-game lead over Indy in the division. Um, I mean, you're, you're up there at the top with the AFC elites right now. So I, I – couldn't be happier with the first five games of the season. Obviously, yeah, five and zero would be the dream. But to say that you know Buffalo came into your house and got a dub, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, I agree. I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you have another question lined up? Uh, I guess the end of the we talked about some of the uh, clock management. I really wanted to talk about the end of the game. That was another hot button issue. So the Texans got the ball, and they're they're trying to set up to get a late field goal. And on a critical play, is it's third down, and they're right on the edge of Kaimi's range. What did you make of the decision to throw the ball? Do you think that's something that came from Bobby Slowick? 
and was not blessed by D'Amico? Do you think D'Amico should have trumped Bobby? Do you think there's an issue with putting the ball in CJ's hands versus running it with a sec or with a third or fourth string running back? Um, there's been so many questions that I've heard today about that specific instance and how they mismanaged it. And I just wonder where you think, I guess maybe the blame should go, the critique. How do you, how do you see it? Yeah, that was terrible. I mean, <laughs> let's just talk about the logic first. Uh, I believe it was like 40 something seconds left. Um, I don't know if the bills had any, any timeouts or not. I don't they think had they none. Did. So at the very worst, you run the ball up the middle for no gain, and you basically leave it up to we have the last possession to try and make the game-winning kick or not. That's it. Like You don't need to get greedy and try and get six, seven, eight yards of the pass. You can have an incomplete pass like we did, which also had intentional grounding on it, so we lost yards and got taken out of field goal range. Or you could have a sack or a fumble. Like So many bad things can happen. It was just – I don't know how that even came about, so – uh, I assume that's Bobby's call, and I assume D'Amico does let him do it. But um, as you pointed to, I think you know it's Bobby's fault for the call, as dumb as heck. But there also is some responsibility of D'Amico's the head coach, and maybe this is a learning moment for him. He needs to be proactive and say, hey, run the ball. Do not throw the ball. Not only do we throw the ball, we've gotten five wide. There was no running back, so there was no threat of a run. Like, you saw it as a fan, like, what are we doing? Like, oh, no, we're an empty. I was like, oh, maybe it'll be a quarterback draw with CJ. Like, no. Um, yeah, and then the fact that it had a miscommunication, like, that situation could not have gone any worse. It was terrible. So I, I tried to argue for it. I, I, just, I, I didn't agree with it. Let me be clear. I did not. I think they should have ran the ball, too. Um, but when you go back and you look, it was going to be something like a 58, 59-yard field goal. It was going to be the edge of Kaimi's range. So I think they're really trying to ensure that give him give him four or five more yards. So maybe he doesn't miss that kick trying to do too much. Um, only later do we find out dude was good from 65 if he wanted to be. But uh, I think that's a learning moment for D'Amico. And like you said, because I really think that influenced the play call. And I, I do believe that that was Bobby's two call. And I, I, I don't think that... D'Amico's ever going to trump Bobby as, as a play caller. He's not going to tell him, hey, you need to run or, hey, you need to pass. I think he totally trusts that if, if Bobby puts the ball in CJ's hands, that he's going to make a smart decision because he's the leader of the team. But um, and just like you, I totally agree that had they ran the ball, we're probably not talking about this play. We're probably not talking about even even worse play out of Buffalo because as bad Still as Brady. the Texans <laughs> screwed this up, Buffalo was like, hold my beer. We can do better. So to, to throw the ball three times inside of your own five yard line, trying to put it all on Josh Allen to go get something done, you know, thank you, Joe Brady for hooking us up. Yeah. He definitely built out slow. Like that was for sure. And it, it's just like ironic. I mean, basically the same thing happened to in the first half, they built us out for a conservative, bad clock management. And then it happened again to end the game. So we, we kind of got bailed out slash lucked out on both halves to end, end of half. So, that's this is one area. Uh, typically, like end of game, we've been good. It's mostly end of first half, which has been a concern for me. We just seem way too conservative and, and not aggressive at all in those situations. So, are you are you of the mind that okay, if they if they give up a turnover, give up three points the other way, you know, so be it. As long as they're trying to go get something at the end of the first half. Um, uh, well, the biggest thing at the end of the first half isn't even that. It's just like we're playing basically not to give them the ball back with time. So it's like playing defensive on offense. Like, um, you know, I'm not even saying like be super aggressive. I'm just saying like, don't just run the clock out. Like we like become our own worst enemy. Like we run the clock out, uh, not this week, but the week before um, when we get down there and then we have one shot at the end zone and we go to into half with a timeout in our pocket when we could have called it earlier. It's like, we're like trying to get too cute with like, you know, like get the points and get the most points you can. Um, but then we did the same thing this week, you know, uh, yesterday or today, I'm sorry. Um, we get a, we killed our, killed our own momentum, first down run, big chunk play. And then we just sit there, let the play clock go down for 30 seconds. All right. Two minute warning. So now you have this big play, big momentum, and you just run all this clock out. Cause you're worried about giving them the ball back with time 
to where you just shoot your offense is now just sitting there for five, 10 minutes waiting to have another play ran. Like to me, that's, that's my issue. Now, are you doing this regardless of the opponent? Like, I think the fact that it's Josh Allen over there and that he can beat you with his legs or his arm probably played a role into that. Where if it was, say, I mean, I guess I can't even say that because he did they the same did it, thing. They did it last week against Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I think it's just D'Amico's, that's a top down. I think a lot of this stuff, and that's my other issue with a lot of the criticism that Bobby gets. I do think an element of this is a top down defensive minded head coach emphasizing an overall conservative game plan, basically saying, you know, put it in the defense's hands and it's worked, <laughs> you know? So. Well, like we've said, Texans got it done. 23-20. Uh, Kaimi Fairbairn, now the all-time leading scorer in Houston Texans history. Uh, those uniforms look absolutely fantastic. I'm even a big fan of Toro dyeing his hair blue because, you know, yeah. H-Town blue all the way. Uh, what did you make of Aziz Alshair? being in the emergency room the day prior, dropped 10 pounds and was literally all over the field. Was that, was that the Jordan flu game for, for a football player right there? Or what? Yeah, that was the flu game, man. I mean, what a, what an addition Aziz has been. And, you know, D'Amico got the exact piece he wanted. That is like the central figure of his defense, the captain of his defense uh, to call the plays, to communicate, but also his defense, you know, four, two, five with only two linebackers, revolves around uh, a unique type of linebacker, one who's uh, fast but can also be physical. Um, and he had two picks that he dropped. I think the first one was tough, but the second one he definitely dropped for sure. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the fact that he did all that coming off of a flu, or I assume it's a flu, I mean, whatever it was, it doesn't sound fun or good, but um, that's the beauty of sports. I don't know. Sometimes I guess, like, you just get that adrenaline going or something. I'm sure he felt terrible after the game, but – yeah, truly remarkable, and he was he was dominant on that field today. So, with that being said, who's your player of the game? Man, I haven't really thought about this uh, player of the game. I'll give you some names. So you've got okay. Kaimi with with the with the the field goals, obviously two fifty yarders, fifty nine yard field goal. You got Aziz Ashair, who was everywhere, like like he was in on the play. I think that. Uh, you know, Allen got, got tangled up, hit his head, you know, knocked him out of the game. Obviously, he had the two yeah. interceptions. Uh, really did a good job, I think, containing James Cook for the most part. I think James Cook got loose a couple times, but I think for the most part, he did a good job there. And then CJ. I don't know if CJ gets enough love for what he does. You know, he passed for over yeah. 300 yards. I mean, he's he's the leading, uh, you know, yardage guy in the NFL. But, you know, sometimes everybody looks elsewhere away from CJ for player of the game? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of boring answer, but you got to say Kaimi he's three for three with the 59-yard game-winning field goal. I mean, geez. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, I don't know if the whole fan base has, but me personally, I guess up until this year, I've kind of taken it for granted, but he is definitely single-handedly, not single-handedly, but I guess some games, but he's been a big reason why we've won a lot of these games, these first four. So I don't know where we'd be without him, but I would definitely give an honorable mention to Aziz Alshair. Like you mentioned, I just looked at his uh, box score, eight total tackles, five solo, one TFL, two passes, defense and uh, two quarterback hits. Um, yeah. And then obviously <laughs> Stefan Diggs showed up big too. So I think he would get an honorable mention as well. But yeah. And then like you mentioned, CJ, I mean, you focus on the turnovers, but as you alluded to earlier, that one interception, that was a really damn good play by that linebacker. Um, and then the fumble, you know, he's got to protect the ball better, but that was tough. Um, but, yeah, he's, he had a good game still. I agree. I agree. I, for me, it was uh, Asher because I just – once I found out how ill he was the day prior, he was in the emergency room, and then he was literally everywhere um, – the, with the linebacking court being so, you know, thin already, um, it's really just him and Toa Toa. You know, I mean, obviously mm -hmm. they've got some guys, but nobody that you really want out there. Uh, for him to to gut it out and play that kind of game, you know, it just kind of, you know, for me it, it, it goes up a notch. But you obviously, Kaimi wins this game. I mean, he's a game ball from, from uh, D'Amico, you know, so I get that too. Yeah. So – 
game in the books. Any final thoughts on Buffalo versus Houston? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I've I've had a lot of Bills fans like anytime I post anything about Stefan Diggs and like not even like trying to like sometimes I'll post stuff that's like you know has a narrative behind it, but like they like were flood my comments every time anytime I post anything about him, just like the the bitter ex girlfriend and like unwarranted come in my comments just to talk mess about him. So this felt good in that regard for Stefan Diggs. Oh, I, I call it like a vindication game. Like he was vindicated. I feel like, you know, obviously, you know, he wanted out, but they act like Josh Allen and McDermott were just completely non complicit in this whole, you know, fallout. Like it wasn't just one person, whether it was 80% digs and 20% Allen, like they refused to put any blame on Allen. Um, but the way this unfolded couldn't have gone any better. I mean, it could have gone better, but Josh Allen had by far probably his worst game of his career, nine of 30. And uh, it basically showed that, yes, he needs a receiver after all this comments about how he doesn't need a receiver. He's got these guys that d- are, that don't care for the ball. I mean, he had 131 yards and 49 of them came on that five yard hit. So, I mean, he didn't do jack. You know, like, we <laughs> shut him down. Um, and then Diggs on our end, like, was a very critical reason to why we won six catches for 82 yards. Um, yeah, so that's my final thought on that. Like, I'm very happy about that. Um, you know, I thought before the year, the bills would be battling to stay around 500 and, and potentially miss the playoffs. I think it's going back to that way. They had an easy schedule to begin this, the season and people thought they were the best team in the league, but it looks like it's starting to level back up. So, yeah, I definitely don't know what that, you know, holds for them. I mean, obviously still at three and two, they're still in the thick of things. Um, that whole division with the way Miami's looking, you don't know what Miami you're going to get while Tua's out. Uh, Aaron Rodgers and, and those boys took took an L in London. Uh, Minnesota's looking to be like the truth. The only blemish on the Texans record, every week they make that L look less and less and less ugly because of Fact. what they're doing to all these other teams. Uh, that They look like the class of the NFC right now. Uh, they're just they're just really getting it done with a whole lot of ex Texans. So I take a little ownership in that because you know those guys really cut their teeth here and then went on to bigger and better things there. So uh, that's pretty much our show for today. Uh, I would be wrong if I did not promote the locker. If you are looking for a new form of fantasy, we have the we have a a league uh, on the Locker app. Come check that out. It's basically a pick em of how the game script is going to go. You go through there each quarter and determine who's going to get this carry, who's going to get this reception, who's going to have the most yards, who's going to score touchdowns. And the more of it you get right, the higher your score goes up, get a chance to win some big cash prizes. Uh, it's $25 stand of the league. Come check us out on the Locker app. Uh, I didn't love it at first because you definitely got to get at it before the game starts. That's like the only knock for me right now. If you wait till a hair after the game starts, doesn't matter if you're working the second quarter on, you're too late. You got to be in there early. But other than that, I think it's pretty cool. You can pretty much set it and forget it. Go in there, pick your guys. They kind of give you guys to choose from. So it kind of limits how, how much damage you can do. And uh, I've, I've been pretty successful so far. I've made a couple bucks. So y'all should come check it out. Uh Garrett, thank you so much for for joining us. We really appreciate you filling in. We are definitely blessed to have you here while James does the dad stuff. Please tell the people where they can find you, what you are cooking up next. Yeah, you can find me at Texans Commenter on basically every social media except for Instagram. It's at Houston Stressens. But um, I just recently launched uh, a little over a week ago my website, HoustonStressens.com. I'm still uh, releasing uh, new features to it, so uh, be sure to check it out. I'm going to get a newsletter going. I also uh, am building out like a content creator, like a directory, essentially, where everyone can kind of host their content on there Uh, and a couple other T-shirt designs and a bunch of other good stuff there. So be sure to check it out and be on the lookout. That's where you're getting your merch. I'm telling you, go check out some of that stuff. I need to go make a purchase as soon as we get done here. Thanks again. Uh, This has been a Houston Texans podcast, The Bullpen. If you like what you're hearing, check us out wherever you get your podcasts. Get on the YouTube, like, subscribe, do the five-star thing. Uh, I know James beat you all over the head. You get one plug from me, and that's all you get. As always, stay classy, Houston, and vamos, Texans. 
Thanks for tuning into The Bullpen, a Texans podcast. Please like, comment, subscribe, and follow along for more Texans talk from The Bullpen.